Okay, I think I'll start. Um, thanks for staying on to um, listen to our couch discussion. Um, we're going to talk about the subject of accommodating the marketplace and where to look for the most um, advanced solutions. Workplace accommodation, workplace accessibility, assistive technologies, these three and other approaches um, not only promise to open up the workplace, but also to create jobs. I trust that our discussion, and during it, we'll be able to identify some of the most promising solutions that are out there, both in um, the highly developed and the less developed countries. I have with me great co-couchers, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce them just by name very quickly and then ask them to introduce themselves a bit more fully with what they've been doing in the area, and then we'll go straight into the conversation. So, first on my right is Immaculada Placentia from the European Commission. Then on my left is Natalia Amelina from UNESCO. Then I have on my right Mukta Al Shibane from Gates, and last but not least, Chris Lee from AMAC. So, Mukta, can you tell me very briefly about what you've been doing at Gates in this area? Thank you, Tom. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, my name is Mokhtar Al Shibani. I'm from Saudi Arabia. And I uh, was a founder and uh, past president of uh, GATES, Global Alliance on Accessible Technology and Environment, based in Canada and uh, exist in 40 countries around the world. We do uh, work uh, uh, with the United Nations and uh, many other uh, international NGO. We uh, promote accessibility uh, in the built environment, transportation, tourism, and uh, ICT. Thank you. Thank you. Ima, can you tell us a wee bit about what you're doing at the European Commission, please? Okay, so I've been doing quite a, a number of things uh, in the European Commission. I started working on the area of research. Uh, research uh, in relation to assistive technologies and uh, accessibility. Then I move more into policies, developing inclusive ICTs, and uh, finally now also working on uh, disability policies, uh, the European Disability Strategy, and also working on the implementation of the UN Convention uh, at, and the rights of persons with disabilities in Europe. And um, my main area of work is on accessibility, the development of um, European accessibility standards and legislation, um, which now is uh, what takes most of my time uh, today. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Natalia, can you tell us a wee bit about what you're doing? Uh, good afternoon for everybody. Uh, my name is Natalia Amelina, and I work for UNESCO Institute for Information Technologies and Education uh, for more than 13 years. Uh, it is uh, UNESCO's institute of uh, international level, uh, category one, and we work with all UNESCO member states all around the world. Our primary goal is to provide technical assistance and policy advice to the UNESCO member states in the field of ICT or information and communication technologies in different levels and different forms of education, starting from early childhood education until higher education. And one of the oldest projects of our institute is devoted to um, information and communication technologies in education of persons with disabilities, and I'm responsible for this project. Um, we collect best practices all over the world, we analyze it, and uh, we share uh, different uh, practices, good practices, and policy recommendations. 
Um, actually, I also have uh, some other projects. Uh, I am responsible for the project of ICT for technical and vocational education and training, ICT for early childhood education, education, and ICT for primary education. So it is brief, and I'm from Moscow, from the Russian Federation. Great. That's all. <laughs> Thanks, Natalia. And last but not least, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Actually, good afternoon. Um, I'm Christopher Lee. I come from Georgia Tech, Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia, in the U.S. I run a program called AMAC Accessibility Solutions and Research Center. Um, Georgia Tech has a long history regarding ICT accessibility, and the project that I run, AMAC, is doing a lot in the area of the training and technical assistance, as well as instruction around ICT. Our primary focus at AMAC is looking at collecting data to make better decisions. For example, over the last couple years, we've been focusing on looking at accommodations in higher education and tying them to retention and graduation rates. So to back up, all these accommodations are making a difference for students actually graduating or staying in higher education. We're hopeful that we can take that information and move it into the employment sector. If you look at the literature out there, there's very little data, it's not very robust at all, in regards to what accommodation, accommodations actually work. So that is one of the primary areas that we've been focused on um, by incorporating a software app package that goes into institutions across the U.S. with about 30,000 students tied to this software application right now. Georgia Tech has, I mentioned, a huge history in ICT accessibility. We have about eight research labs that focus on UX, IoT, um, robotics, and so on. So I'm happy to be here today. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. As you can see, we've got a most wonderful set of co-couchers. Ima, may I start off with the first question, which is, what do you think should be the involvement of government in accommodations in the workplace regarding, say, subsidies, regulations, standards? Okay. Well, I think that governments and, in general, public authorities um, really can do a lot. Yeah. They can do a, a lot. They, they, they can take a, a number of very important measures to support um, the employment and to promote and to advance on the employment of disabled people. First of all, is, uh, I think the first thing to, to, to be done is really to raise awareness. Yeah. Uh, it seems like, it sounds like something obvious, raising awareness about, um, and about, I would say, about two main things. First is the employment situation of disabled people, because it is still not very well known um, uh, what that situation is. And second, about the capacity, the possibilities of disabled people to work, the capacity to work, which is still, in some cases, even uh, restricted by law. So um, that, I would say, is the first measure. Then, of course, um, there is a need to collect data to, to really monitor what is, um, how is that um, gap in um, employment levels between persons with disabilities and persons without disabilities evolving. Um, and then putting a number of measures in, pl in, in place. Um, for example, um, legislation is very important. We have uh, at European level uh, legislation that protects uh, persons with disabilities against discrimination in employment, but also legislation with enabling features. For example, the same uh, EU legislation requires employers to provide reasonable accommodation. The two things go hand in hand. They can also, it's also possible to provide financial incentives. For example, um, there is EU, European legislation that um, clarifies that state aid uh, to create certain types of um, um, uh, employment um, uh, facilities or support employment of disabled people um, is, is, is possible, is compatible with the state aid rules. Um, there is also uh, the need and the, the importance of um, public authorities to support training. I think it was said also during the first panel yeah. that training should be given to persons with disabilities, but also, and very important, to employees. 
but also to employers, sorry, um, not only to employers, but also, for example, to public employment services and private employment services. They need also to cater for the opportunities for um, persons with disabilities to get, uh, to get, um, to get uh, jobs. And uh, finally, uh, another very important thing that should not be underestimated is um, a number of background measures. Yeah. Um, accessibility. Accessibility is a precondition for participation, for participation also in employment, not only to the premises of the employer, but also in general to the public um, transport networks, to the built environment in general, so that persons with disabilities really can participate in employment. This, is, this basic accessibility layer is uh, under the responsibility of public authorities and it is really um, essential to um, essential to um, allow for uh, equal opportunities in employment. So I think I listed quite a number of measures. There are more, but uh, I'll return the microphone to you now. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Mukhtar, um, you've obviously had in, at Gates major interactions um, with governments. What, what do you think the position should be? Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, I believe um, uh, Let's say I started with the accessibility issue uh, since 1980 when it was the, the, the World uh, Day of uh, Disability. And since that time, I'm working as an architect in the field of accessibility. So uh, before the convention, nobody was looking to the accessibility seriously. And uh, when we talk with uh, friends, architects, engineers, and they said, well, it is something, you know, man not mandatory or it's not. But after the convention, uh, the awareness comes out, and that's why we created GATE as a global alliance uh, on accessible, accessibility and technology organization. And uh, with a number of uh, uh, friends uh, from around the world, we started uh, stressing on, uh, uh, on the accessibility issue. And no matter if we look to the disability, the employment, and the work, and the, the built environment, we have two things. We have the outdoor as a general, and we have the indoor also, very important. Uh, I will take an example of a factory who is going to employ 1,000 uh, employees from a disability issue point of view. So that factory, uh, which we had uh, studied, has to have uh, from the wayfinding from the beginning to reach that factory and all the other internal elements of that factory. Yes, there are some hazardous areas that a uh, disabled person cannot work, but there are others who can work. I mean, they can equally uh, work with all the others, uh, you know, if the environment is being uh, uh, created and uh, developed. So the awareness uh, in, among the engineers and the architects around the world is very important, very important. And uh, all the legislations now and uh, the training that uh, our organization is doing, we are studying cities complete cities, you know, to make these cities fully accessible. And uh, it, it helps all of us. It's not only for the disabled person, it's for all of us, the elderly people. I mean, all type of uh, human uh, people living or visiting these cities has to uh, benefit from these accessibility implementations around the world. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mukhtar. Um, Natalia. Chris, have you got anything to add in your experiences? Yes. Uh, well, uh, from the, the states, um, I think it's important that particularly um, when you look at um, Section 508 and Section 503 United States, um, training and technical assistance is crucial. Yeah. Um, and one of the challenges we face is uh, because of the size of the states, ensuring that it is implemented across um, the nation. and is something that I believe all federal and state organizations need to address, um, and they have been, it just needs to be more robust. Great. Natalia, have you got anything to add? You might not have. 
Might not have. <laughs> okay, right. one might not have. Okay, I'm going to turn to Natalia um, for our next question, which is just how important should vocational training be in getting a job? Okay, uh, actually vocational education is very important to everyone nowadays and we all understand it. And it is more important, I think, for people with disabilities. However, it is a coin of two sides, I would say. Because uh, from one point of view, um, we all faced an open and global labor market today. And uh, an employee, even if it has uh, some difficulties, some disability, should have uh, very high competencies that will satisfy the demands of the employer. It is very important because it is some economical, economical law, I would say. And uh, the employee should be paid and the employer should get uh, the high level of performance of the work, the result of the work, anyway. And from another point of view, any government which have signed and ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities should provide the opportunities for all to realize themselves, to implement their social role everywhere. So uh, uh, the employment will be the best way to, um, to integrate, to in include these people into society. So it is a kind of two sides of the coin. Um, faced with high levels of youth unemployment, um, rapidly changing labor markets, uh, um, transform uh, technological advancements and social inequalities, many governments all over the world are trying to develop uh, skills and upgrade the skills of their citizens and they uh, do it through technical and vocational education and training. In this context, UNESCO is calling for transformation of technical and vocational education and training, so it covers the full range of skills that are needed for the world of work. UNESCO considers TVET uh, as a part of lifelong learning concept. And uh, this uh, concept uh, uh, is... Uh, providing an opportunity for all, uh, including those with disabilities, to get uh, educated and to get employed. Uh, the transformed vision of technical and vocational education and training uh, includes not only formal education from our point of view, but also non-formal and informal education as well and also through advanced technologies like information and communication technologies. Based on its new strategy for technical and vocational education and training, UNESCO supports uh, the efforts of its member states to enhance the relevance of the technical and vocational uh, education and training systems to equip uh, youth and adults uh, with the skills required for employment. Uh, so, vocational education and training plays a very important uh, role in the employment from every point of view. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks very much. Chris, I know you would like to say something. Yes. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, I, I agree. I mean, Georgetown University just came out with a, uh, a research um, publication that talks that just in the United States, there's going to be over a shortage of five million um, employees that are going to be needed. Um, and that is primarily because the lack of um, training, um, the lack of instruction, and there's some big concerns around that. And we know the fields, um, at least in the United States we do, we know that it's gonna be STEM related, educational related, healthcare is gonna be a huge area where we can have individuals that can populate, specifically people that have disabilities um, or the aging population. So I think training and technical assistance, vocational training technical assistance is crucial. And our vocational, um, schools in the states have been doing a pretty good job, but now we've got such a robust um, um, resources around MOOCs, uh, the massive open online courses out there that are free. 
And for a lot of individuals with disabilities, with transportation being a related issue, this is a great opportunity. The challenge becomes, regarding ICT accessibility, all these MOOCs fully accessible. Can they get access? And we have issues with that, with some of the, the platforms out there. So vocational training's there. Yeah. We need it. We know it. It can be remote and virtual or blended. Yeah. Um, but we've got some work regarding the accessibility of platforms. Right. Thank you. Can, Any, can I so, add something? Oh, yes, absolutely. Sorry. No, don't worry. Okay. Uh, sorry, I would like to add some um, example, I would say. Firstly, uh, I would like to pay your attention to the fact that, uh, of course, the educational approaches should be transformed. They should be flexible for, uh, for, for a new generation and for those students with disabilities. And I would like to provide you uh, some very short example. Uh, we have a pilot project, um, our institute, in collaboration with ITU, it is International Telecommunication Union, which is also an UN agency. And at present we have equipped already five specialized IT centers in the region of the post-Soviet Union countries. And these centers are equipped with specialized hardware and software for different kinds of people with disabilities. Uh, the main um, function of uh, such centers are firstly to be a kind of open uh, platform, open space for collaboration and for access to any information and to any educational resources. First of all, in digital format, like you mentioned, massive online open courses, it is very important, of course. And um, uh, people with disabilities can come to this open platform uh, space and they can get consultations from the specialists. And the second role of such centers uh, is to provide uh, trainings, trainings for local specialists, for local experts. And these centers also serve like centers of excellence. And we as UNESCO has already arranged several trainings with the help of uh, leading international specialists. And uh, we focused our um, trainings on uh, different applications of ICTs and uh, in different spheres. So it is our reply to some, um, some questions. Absolutely, okay. thanks very much. Do you have any particular comments? Um, if not, then I'll go on to... Um, Tom, can I add one other thing? I'm sorry. Yes, very, very quickly. Um, <laughs> the other issues, other than vocational yeah. training, is self-advocacy skills. Right. And we can't forget that yeah. because disclosing you that you have a disability, how you disclose it, when you disclose it, what yeah. accommodations that you actually need is so crucial. Right. Thank you. Um, I know we're getting short of time. We have two more questions. Um, the next one goes straight to Chris. It's a kind of technical question. Well, more technical. So when it actually comes to accommodating or accommodations in office space, what is mainstream and universally available? And then probably more important, looking forward, what is cutting edge? So, so I did, thank you, Tom. Um, I did a, a quick... Um, scan of the literature out there prior to, um, to the conference because I knew the question. <laughs> um, and um, as I mentioned earlier in my intro, um, there's not a lot of data out there that basically specifies what is mainstream. But we do have an idea of what is being used out there, what is happening out there in the field in corporations. Um, but again, there's not a lot of literature to support it. So I, I, I run down a list here, um, not in any particular order. Um, Flex time is still considered to be something that, that is used in an accommodation. Telecommuting, um, we're seeing that as, as something that is still up, up high. Um, personal assistance, obviously, is up there. Um, ergonomic chairs and desk have really jumped. Um, you see that more and more when you, you do the scan of the literature. Um, and all types of, of chairs um, and desk now. Um, um, they have all kinds of really interesting um, ones that are out there, whether they're desks that actually pull up or they'll, the desks that actually sit on top of a desk, like a platform. You'll see more and more of that being used. Software, obviously, um, different applications are still out there, whether it's text-to-speech, whether it's word prediction software, voice recognition software. Um, you'll see more of that happening. And obviously, in the mainstream, a lot of the operating systems, whether it's Mac or, or other operating systems, will, um, OS systems, it will 
pretty, you're seeing that a lot of that being built in now. So that's pretty exciting. We see that with the iPhone and, and other options out there. Dual monitors is in the literature quite a bit, which makes sense, not hugely expensive, especially for individuals who are visually impaired. We're seeing more of that. Um, personal voice organizers, specifically tied to some of the literature out there, is tied to the Amazon Alexa um, or Echo. Um, you'll see more of that being used for spelling, for getting definitions, for environmental control related issues, which is interesting. One-handed keyboards, switches, um, for individuals who have nonverbal disabilities that cannot speak um, verbally, we're seeing a lot of tablets and a lot of apps like AAC devices that have come down. The pricing, unbelievable. So that's pretty exciting. And um, beacons for kind of high tech is what you're seeing. So GPS beacons. So if you're blind and your, your, um, your organization has beacons put in with your smartphone, you can actually get room from room, which is interesting. Not a lot being done in the States, a lot being done in Spain, tied to the ANSE Foundation. Um, and um, the other thing that we're seeing, which is really interesting, is haptic footwell out there and kind of cutting edge so that will vibrates tied to your smartphone for GPS that can take you different places. The other thing I would just mention, and I'll turn it over, um, we've got great vendors out in the hallway here. One of them is um, OrCam, which is fascinating. I was just looking at them up, which is an intuitive portable device with a smart camera. If you point it, it would basically read what's on there, I guess using OCR. Um, so individuals who are visually impaired or have dyslexia that have trouble reading, it's a great um, cutting edge technology. Thank you. Mukta, what have you seen at the cutting edge? Well. Uh... As we all know, uh, who designed the buildings? There are architects who design the buildings and uh, uh, around the world. And uh, there are interior designers also who are involved in designing uh, most of the interior. But the problem is uh, there is no standardization in this issue around the world. So one of the things that we, uh, uh, I participate in is with the ISO to develop the first standard, uh, standard for the built environment. And it was uh, approved in 19, um, 2011. Uh, and now we are uh, this year planning to update this standard and make it more widely and uh, cover other areas, you know, to, uh, we know that there's 30 countries around the world who have standard, you know, uh, applicable and codes, but there are another 160 countries around the world who have nothing. Really, it is, it is a big issue. What to follow? How to deal with the, the accessibility issue in these uh, buildings, you know? Uh, people build traditionally with the knowledge they have, a contractor who doesn't know why we have the level of this, the, the, the ramp or the doors or the, all these things, why it is there. So he just built it the way he liked. And at the level of the building controllers or municipalities or whatever, they don't know about it. You know, They say, well, we have no idea. So this is a, a real big problem to achieve uh, a very good standardization to be implemented around the world and, uh, and to be followed to help uh, most of the, you know, the community and the disabled uh, people to uh, live and work in a, a very good environment. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mukhtar. So one last question before I let you go and get your coffee or tea or water. Ima. Standing really above everything as you do, um, what have you noticed any really outstanding developments or in the innovations in the last couple of years that you thought, I must remember this and I must tell other people about this because I think this is, this is really great and it can be across everything. Well, what a, a question. A bit difficult, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. No, I, 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 I would like to turn your question into much more uh, a, general, a general answer. I mean, okay. I think what has been really outstanding the last year, what is really amazing is um, that technology um, is not 
that does not need to be a barrier anymore. Technology offers you really any, almost any type of solution. This is what I've seen really a big, big move, um, shift from when I started 20, 25 years ago working on assistive technology where, you know, any solution, let me, for example, mention you, we had uh, projects uh, dealing to um, how to deal with graphical user interfaces. And at that time, um, uh, it was really a big barrier. People were trying to capture with a camera um, the, the screen and then trying to identify whether they, what was being the screen was an image, was an icon, or what was the function of the button and so forth, because that information was not there. Today, the day, uh, that is really over. I mean, there is this um, evolution towards mainstreaming certain accessibility features of technology and connecting better with assistive technology, and that is really um, what I, I see really as amazing. The point is to get it really implemented regularly implemented, in being known and being part of our, of our mainstream um, life and solutions. To tell you, I mean, there is nothing um, today from a technological point of view um, difficult about making a job advertisement accessible so that people uh, can read it on the web. Well, today is still a lot of job advertisements are not accessible. What about models for CVs when you get a CV? Um, sometimes you have to fill in a form that it is not accessible. Um, what about intranets at, uh, at uh, our work? I mean, many of the tools you have mentioned are great, but if the intranets are not working, then that's a problem. So I think that um, technology, any evo this evolution of technology allows us for making all these solutions available, yeah. and that is really the wow. I mean, now is, let's use it. Right. Let's make it a reality. This is what I really see as, a, as, as the main, um, uh, yeah, important change throughout the years. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Natalia, working with technology as you do, can you give us one or two of your absolute favourites that you're pushing as being the cutting edge and taking you forward at UNESCO? Okay, I would say that uh, really information and communication technologies has a, uh, has a great power in education, in employment, in everyday life. Um, I will share with you good examples a little bit later in a, in a future, because uh, at present I would like to announce uh, some new project which um, will be implemented by our institute uh, in, co in cooperation, I hope, with you, with the experts and uh, private expert center organizations, and this project will be devoted to ICT potential for skills development of persons with disabilities. We will collect both uh, advanced practices in the field of ICT in technical and vocational education and training, as well as uh, good policy solutions in this field. Um, that is why I invite you, all of you, if you are interested in cooperation, to contact me. You can fi uh, easily find my contacts uh, at the conference website and just send me a letter that you are ready for cooperation and you have some uh, topic of expertising. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Chris. Ima, I could not agree with you more. I mean, your, <laughs> your comments about ensuring that platforms are accessible is crucial. You can have all the AT you want, but if those developers aren't developing um, accessible platforms, it's pretty scary out there. And we need certifications regarding web accessibility. And IAAP, which is, a, which is a, an organization out there, um, uh, is, is one that is actually taking that on in June. There's going to be one of the first web accessibility certification, it's a micro certification actually that will be out there. It's crucial. Regarding technology, okay, I can get really excited about this. I know I don't have any time. Um, Nokia is doing some cool stuff. So Nokia has developed um, something, I have not seen it. Um, so it's, it's really, I'm not really privy to all the information, but it is a magnetic or tattoo of some sort that sits on the arm or I guess wherever, and um, it allows vibration with the phone. So if you're someone who's deaf and um, you don't hear the phone ringing, it would actually vibrate. It could do many other things, I would assume. So that's one really cool um, um, technology out there, and there's just so many of them, but because of time, I'll, I'll talk okay. it over. Thanks, and you can always talk to Chris afterwards. And finally, Mukta, as the last word on the subject. 
what you've seen and you, one of your favorites? Well, uh, technology has developed, you know, uh, and uh, solutions are coming for the last uh, uh, 10 years, actually, more than what happened, uh, you know, before. And uh, it, it helps uh, yeah, and all the people uh, around the world. Uh, the problem is still uh, with languages uh, barrier. There is a language barrier here still. Uh, in English, if things are more developed than the Arabic or than the other Sawahili or another language that is uh, still had not uh, the capacity to use the, te the assistive technology and you know in, in their uh, uh, daily life uh, experiences. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all. Ima, Natalia, Chris, Mukhtar. I enjoyed my discussion. This whole conference is about discussion. So these four, uh, no, Ima's leaving sadly later on this afternoon, but I believe everybody else is going to be around. Please continue your conversations with them because I know from experience that they are happy to converse and they really know their subjects. Anyway, thank you very much indeed for listening to our couch discussion this afternoon. I think I've given you a wee bit of time for your tea and coffee. I think you've had your um, marching orders from Caroline, so you'll know where to go next and when. But I would just like to say thank you very much indeed, panel and co-couchers. Thank you, everybody.